Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world. Welcome to Conversations with Rudy Rivera. Today, I am thrilled to have as my special guest, the Juris Doctor. I asked him earlier if he could fix my torn meniscus. He says no, but I guess you don't take my insurance, Steve. Uh, Absolutely not. My guest today, Steve, is president of Seckler Attorney Coaching. He's been coaching attorneys for 25 years. He's devoted his entire legal process to helping lawyers make better decisions, have career enhancement, and just be happier as a whole. Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Rudy. I'm really honored to be your guest. And you know, Rudy and I met when I attended an episode of Conversations with Rudy on the subject of leadership, and I thought it was so great that I, I wrote to him to tell him, and he turned around and he said, well, how'd you like to be on my show? So we ended up speaking and really hit it off. I had him on my podcast, and I thought his own story was really interesting, and now here we are. Uh, so this is just one example of the many great relationships that many of us have been able to form in the world of Zoom. Uh, since 2020. So a little bit more about me. So I, as, as Rudy said, I've devoted my whole legal career to helping attorneys find more satisfaction with their careers. And I now focus 100% of my energy coaching lawyers on marketing, career transitions, and on leadership. For many years, I was also in the legal search business, but as of 2022, I'm now doing what I consider to be my true calling, and all I'm doing is coaching. Basically, I like to say that I help lawyers stop thinking like a lawyer and start thinking like a marketer or a leader. I, I hear people say that all the time. You sound too much like a lawyer. You sound too much like a lawyer. And I think what that comes from is people want a smart lawyer. They don't want a dumb lawyer. So I remember as a young lawyer having to show off with all these words. And basically saying, oh, whereas and but for and trying to impress my knowledge, right? And I think lawyers even today have a tendency to do that. It's true. And, and what do you think, um, when you say not act like a lawyer, in general, tell me what that means. Because we're educated as lawyers. I've been a lawyer for 40 years. Tell me what that means. Okay. So I always like to start this topic with a story. In July, I got a phone call around one o'clock in the afternoon from a lawyer who I didn't know, but she had been referred to me by a lawyer I do know. And she asked me if I could fill in for a speaker at a live event. Their speaker had canceled at the last minute. I heard her request. I heard where she wanted me to be in five hours. And this was my immediate reaction. Ugh. You're excited. No, my react, my reaction was, Ugh, I have to take a shower. <laughs> I have to get dressed. I have to drive to Boston. Where am I going to park? Do I even yeah. want to talk to this organization? So that was my, that was my default reaction. And then I did what I always do to myself in these situations. I coached myself through it because I've retrained myself over many, many years. And I said, well, this could be a really interesting opportunity. I haven't done a live presentation in three years or two and a half years. And it would be a lot of fun to get out. And so I did it. It was great. I had a lot of fun. I met some really interesting people. And I was really glad that I had done it. So the reason why I like talking about this topic is because I'm just like you. I am a lawyer. I think like a lawyer. I act like a lawyer. And every single day, I have to change my mindset. So let me just give you a few of the top level bullets, but we'll get into a lot more of them. So as lawyers, we are skeptical. We are risk averse. We prefer structure over flexibility. We like precedent and we prefer analytical thinking. And these are great qualities when we are representing clients, but they may interfere with our relationship building. And that is the foundation of all our business development, our career advancement and leadership. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is a little bit generalized. There are of course, many, many exceptions, many lawyers who don't fit into this stereotype. 
but Dr. Larry Richard is sort of my my intellectual guru. He's a, a actually a lawyer. He practiced for ten years, and then he realized practicing law wasn't a good fit for him. This was in the eighties. Went and got his PhD, and he has studied lawyers more than anyone else. And he knows a lot about lawyer personalities. So a lot of these stereotypes that I talk about and that we will talk about are actually evidence-based. There are There's evidence that on the whole, lawyers are more skeptical. On the whole, lawyers are more risk-averse and down the line. So that's kind of like my basic, my basic well, introduction. Well, let's talk about this skepticism, okay? Because if you contrast the lawyer between the businessman, right? The businessman is viewed as a guy that takes risk, right? You know, Jeff Bezos, the many risks he took with 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 Amazon. You know, there are other great people that took risks. That at Thomas Edison with the light bulb. You know, all the risks these people took. Where lawyers, I think, historically are trained, you can't do that. And I think it's easier to say no than it is to say yes. You can do it. That's, that's, I think, is, is a problem. The slightest bit of risk, a lawyer will say, ah, that's the risk, okay? And what I think the lawyer needs to change is, this is the risk, but at that point, you switch over to a business advisor, right, with your client. Um, and, and that's why lawyers, you know, point two of your, your many topics is lawyers being risk averse. That's, I think, one of the drawbacks to being a lawyer. Well, it's a it's a drawback in in one sense, although the world does need lawyers. You know, I, I I was talking to a lawyer the other day. I was having coffee with somebody that I placed uh, when I was in the recruiting business many years ago at a dot com company that, like many, went belly up. And, you know, they burned through seventy five million dollars worth of venture capital and they failed ultimately. And that was because they were spending money on things like, which I found out later, just actually a week ago, um, on jet, you know, on private jets and on uh, prostitutes. So they needed lawyers to kind of tell them this was a no-no. Obviously the lawyers didn't have enough impact. So the company ended up taking obviously too much risk. But the point of what I was trying to say is that the world needs lawyers. It's not like we're all bad. It's not like we don't serve a purpose. It's not like lawyers don't do anything of value. You need people to be the entrepreneurs, to think about the possibilities, to be the Jeff Bezoses, the Steve Jobs. You also need people to look at what they're doing and then say like, well, here's a risk that is not worth taking. Here's a risk, you know, here's how you can do it. But I think what happens, and you've been in-house now for a long time, but I think what happens to lawyers that go in-house, they start to realize that I have to make some decisions here, that the people around me, like if you're going to survive in a corporation, you need to be able to make decisions. A lawyer on the outside is more apt to present the risk, but then let the client make the decision. Wouldn't you say that's true? That's true. The big difference between an outside counsel and somebody like me is the outside counsel is assigned to do a certain task. Tell me what the law is on this and tell me what the risks are. Then I, with the inside business unit, go over the legal opinion and then we decide what's the risk. And is it worth taking the risk? That's that's you know how it works internally. So my component has a my my position has a little bit more of a component to it because I have to know the company and I have to know what it can do, what it can't do, you know. And that helps from knowing the business. So the advice I would give the outside counsel is know your, your client's business. Because when you're advising the inside counsel, it's better. But, but you know, I, I think it, the thing that they pay us the most for, well, not the most for, but they, what's the most valuable is to be objective. Because sometimes the business unit, the, uh, the, they, the, they drink the Kool-Aid. This is a great deal. It's never going to fail. And we're there to say, not necessarily don't do it, but wait a minute. Let's think about this thing object objectively and see if you think the same thing, right? That, I think, is the true value of somebody who either can be a great lawyer, but also not think like a lawyer, right? Because then you engage your client in a dialogue. So, cool. 
Well, so can, so can we talk a little bit about about marketing? Because I think that's an area where thinking like a lawyer really gets in the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What's your concept of lawyers marketing? You see so much of it now. So there's a lot of obstacles that lawyers face in marketing. I mean, for fundamentally, I don't think law most lawyers like to see themselves as anything other than a professional. Marketing to those of us who went to law school might feel a little bit dirty. Like I know in my family, I grew up with a father who was a math professor, a mother who was a school psychologist, and my father thought that all business people were crooks. So I did not grow up with the, the notion that I was going to ever go into business. What I've learned over time is that selling legal services is really about relationship building. And it's not about a hard sell. And in fact, a hard sell is probably not going to work very well when you're trying to sell legal services. But a lot of lawyers feel like it's a little bit distasteful. Uh, another thing that happens in trying to market legal services is that you are trying to put a lot of irons in the fire, take a, lot, a whole bunch of uh, opportunities and you don't know where your business is going to come from when you when you're working on a, a legal matter you sort of have a beginning middle and an end probably like you're trying to close a, a loan or you're trying to get to a settlement in a litigation or create an estate plan but marketing is more nebulous like you may do 10 things and eight of them may produce no results but two of them may and that's really hard for lawyers so a lawyer might do a presentation and nothing happens and then they think like gee I did a presentation I didn't get any clients maybe I shouldn't do presentations anymore but but the the way lawyers have advertised has changed dramatically over the years there was a time when you couldn't and in Missouri when the Supreme Court said you could then all the commercials came out um I think you need to be selective as to how you market right you're either going to market yourself as like a snake oil salesman or you're going to market yourself in a more professional capacity, right? But you still need to market yourself as a person, right? Every time you meet a client, every time you interact with the client, that to me really is the marketing. Absolutely. But you want it, you want it to be authentic. So, you know, if you like one of the jokes that I tell if I'm doing workshops on, on marketing, you know, I'll ask the group, how many of you like playing golf? Now, golf is actually a really good way to spend a lot of time with people, unless you don't like golf, in which case you probably shouldn't play golf. Some people, I have clients that really like writing, some that really like speaking, and some that don't like speaking or writing. They shouldn't be doing those things because it's going to be hard to motivate yourself. My golf friends are going to hate me because I'd rather watch paint dry. I get it. <laughs> I get invited to golf outings and I say, don't, don't, uh, don't, wait, don't waste your time inviting me for something. We have a question. Now that you can see the lawyers from outside, although you are also a lawyer, do you identify more with them or do you prefer to distance yourself? Me personally, I, I identify as a lawyer, strangely. But I mean, I haven't practiced law really, honestly, really ever. I mean, I graduated from Northeastern university school of law in, in 88 and I spent most of the beginning part of my career working for Massachusetts continuing legal education organizing seminars and really meeting the leaders of the bar and seeing how they really navigated their own careers and seeing what they did to advance their careers and that's how I got interested in 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 coaching and also how I began recruiting but I've never stopped identifying as a lawyer I feel like I am a lawyer. And as I said, in my little anecdote, I feel like I think like a lawyer. I mean, I'll give you another example. I sent out a proposal in, in the summer to a client who I'd already done some work for, and I didn't hear back from them. And so within a week, I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? And then my mind goes to, I charge too much. And then I spoke to somebody in my network a few days later, and then I thought to myself I didn't charge enough and then I'm thinking oh my god you know I didn't do a good job on the first two parts of the project and then of course I followed up a few weeks later and I got my man the managing partner on the phone and everything was hunky-dory he'd been really busy with some matters 
and he didn't have time to get back to me, but he was interested in moving forward. So as lawyers, we see this rejection. We see this as a rejection when somebody doesn't communicate with us and follow up is really hard because it feels a little bit risky. You're putting yourself out there. You're not getting any feedback. You start to go to a very negative place. We as lawyers tend to be negative. And oh, I'm sorry. No, do you think we as lawyers need a lot of positive reinforcement? I think we do. <laughs> we need like, that and the tap on the back, right? Absolutely. And Rudy, I think you're wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you, just made my, you just made my day. Well, well you know, you know, it's a silly, it's a silly thing. I mean, it's a really silly thing, but like let's move on to leadership and what what does an effective law firm leader do? I mean, a lot of lawyers are so analytical and then they move into leadership roles in law firms or in corporate departments and they sort of forget that there are human beings that are reporting to them or doing work for them and that those people want to be appreciated. And they're just thinking very much about, well, the task wasn't done right, so why should I say thank you? But the deepest need that all of us have is to be appreciated as human beings. So if you're going to be an effective leader, you got to take off that analytical, the associate didn't do the work well, hat and say thank you as often as you can. And if the associate didn't do the job well, well, you you need to have sort of a growth mindset, which is not what most lawyers have. Most lawyers have a fixed mindset. So I, I've heard many stories of, and as a recruiter in particular, associates who kind of got off on the wrong foot. They did one assignment that didn't go well with a partner. And that partner will never think of them again as a lawyer or as somebody who could be an effective lawyer. Part of that those is, partners, but those partners forget that they made mistakes too. Well, of course, but but part of that goes to the risk aversion of the partner. The the partner is worried about the client getting pissed off when the work isn't being done well. But it's also the rigidity that a lawyer that lawyer that lawyers sometimes have, and not being able to see that. Well, if I make an investment in this associate, they're going to do a great job for me, and they're going to be committed. They just want the work done now as well as possible. Lawyers also, according to Larry Richard, sort of score high on urgency. So we're not the most patient people. We want to get things done. But if you're trying to cultivate relationships so that you could advance your career, if you want to build relationships so that you can be more effective in marketing, getting your referral sources to refer work to you, if you want a team to follow you, you need to have patience. But leadership is a soft skill that you don't learn in law school. Absolutely. You have to learn it outside. I really think that law school should teach lawyers how to be businessmen. Now, since I went to law school in 80, you got your law degree, you passed the bar, you practiced, and that was it. You weren't, in my mind, you weren't even a lawyer when you graduated from law school. You didn't become a lawyer until you started practicing and learning how to do your craft. But the people skills, I think, have always been, you know, somewhat lacking early on in my practice. Uh, I'm the lawyer. I'm the smart one. I went to law school. I know what to do. And that's an attitude that I think people have. And it, that may be true, but you want to make the client feel important, right? You want, and, and the people around you, you want to make them feel important that they're contributing part of it. And that, that's what I think is often lacking. I agree. And I think a lot of lawyers get caught up in their, you know, their desire to, to their, their, you know, lawyers can be very competitive. Uh, I had a client that told me a story about one of his partners was chairing a department and wanted to sort of build up the esprit de corps. So he started circulating some kind of a puzzle or something, and everybody was allowed to kind of weigh in and send their answers. But the partner would always send his answers in first. And after a while, like the team was like, yeah, we're not going to participate in this. Why you know, am I, I doing this? Yeah. I, we call that hogging the credit. Right, right. And a good leader will share the credit, will we'll give recognition. And if you're really a good leader, if you're uh, you know, a good managing partner, should not be the star of the show. A good managing partner should be taking care of the people and trying to help the people that are working for the firm to do a better job and figure out what's getting in their way. But sometimes people's egos get in the way. And sometimes the people that elevate, that get elevated to partnership, I'm sorry, to managing partner, are the people that have the biggest practice. And the qualities that made them 
become the biggest rainmakers may not be the best qualities for leading other people because they may be very competitive. They may be focused on how they can build their own business and not as focused on how they can build their team. It's something that you should have learned in kindergarten, that is play nice. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that book, Everything I Learned, I, I Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. Play, play nice. When you give people credit for their contribution, you've got a stronger team. But if not, you're an island. People don't trust you. They don't have a vested interest in it. When I've given talks to law firms, one of the first things I've said to them is invest in your associates. Make them, you know, part of this, the, the problem solving solution. Because I did an interesting conversation on age gap diversity. And what that brought to light to me is, you know, these young people are pretty smart and they do have something to contribute. The fact that I'm old doesn't mean that I know everything. So I, I think if anything is for his survivor, survival, he ought to get input from younger people or her survival. But, you know, I, I've seen situations, Steve, where people hog up the credit. And I've seen situations where they just include everybody. It's a team effort. Those law firms tend to thrive more. They really tend to thrive more. For example, something that's very common is I'm going to hog up the client. I don't want you talking to my client. Well, why not? When, when I'm uh, in a, a law firm meeting and I'm talking to the partner, the associate there, I always, always ask the associate, what do you think? And when the, the partner interrupts and says, excuse me, but I want to hear from the associate. So I, I agree with you, Steve. Leadership is really, really, really key. But too often, we don't even know what a leader is. Or we don't know how to lead. So if I were your customer, if I were your client, what would you tell me about leadership? How would I develop this, lead, these leadership exercises? I, you know, I've been the lawyer for 40 years and, you know, it's hard to change spots, but what's the one piece of advice you would give me? Well, first of all, I think anyone can change no matter how old you are. There's growing evidence that we are much more capable of building new skills and our brains keep evolving. It used to be, you know, the notion that you, you hit middle age and you're sort of on the way down. I don't think that's the, the contemporary thinking anymore. Mm -hmm. I th so I think the starting point is becoming self-aware of, of what your strengths and weaknesses are, because we all have strengths and weaknesses. A lot of times, if I start working with a leader, the first point of contact is to talk to the people that they work with, who they report to and find, I mean, sorry, who they report to and who report to them to, it's called a 360, you know, evaluation, looking all around the person and see what those people have to say, because what somebody reports to me about how they are coming across isn't necessarily how other people are perceiving them. Well, which, that's because we all think we're wonderful. Well, we are all wonderful. <laughs> not, just good, not just good leaders, right? <laughs> right, right. So it's becoming more self-aware of how people are perceiving you. That's, that's usually the starting point. And, and I think people don't want to see negative things so they want to keep a positive image of themselves, but don't want to really do a dwell into, well, these people must think I'm negative. That's the skepticism, right? Right. Like right. this guy want to hire me because, because, because. One of the things we're going to talk about today, Steve, is also career transitions. Mm -hmm. in, in law school, I graduated with a with with a classmate who got tired of law and decided to be an art dealer. And I saw him about 10 years ago. I said, how are you doing? He said, I am happy. Mm -hmm. Are those skills transferable? Can you transit? How easy is it to transition from a lawyer to, say, a non-legal position? The most common transitions that I see lawyers making are sort of law adjacent positions. Like, I'm not a practicing lawyer. I do. I did recruiting. I do coaching. So I'm working in the profession, but I'm not actually practicing. There are transitions that lawyers can make within their firms. They could take on a role of professional development. In some of the bigger firms, there are practice managers. So looking for a bridge that connects where you are to you know, where, where you want to get to. You're already known 
unknown entity in your in your firm and your company and that's an opportunity to take on some other role if you're a junior associate and you're not really sure that you really want to keep practicing joining some committees the associates committee maybe you can get involved in recruiting internally so that you can sort of test out some of these things uh, another way people make transitions is they get to know people in a particular industry and then just by having contacts and having a network within an industry they can take on some other kind of role in that industry other than practicing law and sometimes lawyers first they practice in a law firm then they go in-house and then once they're in-house they start to seek out other types of roles like um, a friend of mine transitioned from in-house counsel eventually general counsel took on some human resources responsibilities then started doing more operational stuff and now he's like a COO and not responsible at all for for legal I've seen a number of situations in some prominent companies that the GC has become the CEO or the GC has become the chief uh, administrative officer, chief operations officer. And so the transition is, is, is possible, but you're in a situation where you're in that world and you have the opportunity to make that leap. But if you were coming in as an outside counsel and you say, hey, I wanna be the COO, that would be much more difficult than coming from inside, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and in, and in part because again, it goes to the whole mindset issue. Because when you're when you're being paid as outside counsel, your clients, you know, they want to know what the risks are. When you go in house, even though a good outside lawyer is also helping clients make decisions, they get more accustomed to when they go into the in house environment in in making those decisions. And until you make that transition away from private practice. And until you're thinking more about possibilities, then you know it, it, it's it's harder to make it's harder to to be acting in any capacity other than as a lawyer coming from a law coming directly from a law firm. Well, when you say that you can transfer careers, what are some of the skills that lawyers have that make them transferable? Well, lawyers have a lot of great skills that are transferable. They're good at organizing information. They're good at crafting an argument. They're good at, at advocating for things. And frankly, they're just really good at getting stuff done. Project management, helping organize teams to get things done. That Those are all skills that lawyers have. I think the, the probably one of the best skills a lawyer has is crisis management. Hmm. Litigation, if you're a litigation lawyer, things can change at the drop of a hat and you have to adapt quickly. You're in the middle of a jury trial. Somebody makes a statement that shouldn't have been made, especially by your client, and then you have to completely adapt. So I think adaptability and crisis is probably one of the biggest talents of lawyers. Okay, I see a question in here. The, this um, is a really good question. What messages can you give the lawyers who have stopped practicing to dedicate ourselves to our families and want to return to the profession after several years? So I so there's a lot of initiatives going on around the country to sort of on ramp, particularly women who've gone off to to raise families, but not only women. And so there there are organizations and if somebody emails me I could dig up the names because I can't think of one off the top of my head but the best way to get back in is to sort of take on projects and sort of work your way in incrementally like if you could afford to do that if you don't need a full-time job with benefits there's a lot more opportunity to do work on a contract or a fractional basis so you know it's 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 a matter of starting to network and and tapping into your old network and looking at what you used to do and the people that you used to work with and getting out and talking to a lot of people and doing a lot of networking. That, that was a really good question from a member of our audience. But I can tell you my experience has been with those people, when I say those people who've taken a hiatus for whatever reason, staying home with children, often can be better than people who've been practicing for a long time. One of my lawyers in Mexico was out of the practice for a number of years, and that person turns out to be probably one of the best lawyers I have in Mexico. 
True. Yeah, they're hungrier. They they're they're more you know committed. They feel more appreciative that they've been given a chance. Well, what skills? Uh, in line with that question, Steve, what skills do you develop? Say not practicing, uh, just say being uh, a housewife or a, or a house husband, you know, anymore that help you as a lawyer. Uh, well, having never been a housewife, I, I'm not sure I'm in a great position to answer that, but having heard women talk about this issue, there's been a lot written about this in the popular press. Women are very good at multitasking, much better, often much better than men, because they're juggling, often bearing a lot more of the responsibility at home to get the kids off to the soccer games and getting the meals on the table. I think this generation of millennials, things are a little bit more equal. But women are very good multitaskers, and, and that's a really, you know, having that flexibility to jump from one thing to another is, is very valuable in the practice of law. I didn't think you'd have the experience as a housewife. <laughs> it was just a wild guess, but I didn't think you had that experience. Um, I, I think what you, what you, I think you learn exactly the same things that, that, that you said, but I think you also acquire a sense of maturity say that say a person who's been practicing who's younger and practicing as much time as say you have been even though you may be older you've got that maturity that that person doesn't have and i think that could be an added an added bonus i think also like when you're working in a place and sort of things are done a certain way i mean i think one of the qualities of lawyers that i can't remember if i put this on the list but you know lawyers tend to be more structured and not as flexible in their thinking and somebody who is in an organization and they're just used to doing things the way it's always been done. I mean, a lot of law firms, you know, they're thinking about an initiative and they want to know what the law firm down the block has done, which is not particularly entrepreneurial or creative. So if you've been out of the law firm world and you're sort of seeing other aspects of different ways, different companies operate or different services that you're using in your life or just you just get different experiences then you come back and you bring that to your corporate law department or your law firm or or, or the government agency that you work for and i think you bring other perspectives that people that are just you know in one place don't don't have or they it's harder to gain that experience just being in one place so to whoever or whomever in our audience is listening, whether it's on Zoom or on LinkedIn, don't let that be a deterrent for you to developing yourself as an attorney and getting out there into the marketplace if that's what you want. You know, rather than listing it as, well, that's a bad thing, list it as a good thing because you acquire these skills. Mm -hmm. I think everything has to have a positive spin, right? Absolutely. You know, for example, and we're we're, diver, di, uh, diver, we're diverting a little bit, but for example, one of my pet peeves is when you go to a do a speech and you get up there and you're in the podium, you say, "Oh my God, there are so many people here who are so much smarter than me." And God, I just hope I don't embarrass myself because such and such is brilliant. And then my thing is, sit down then and let's let such and such come on. But you don't start the conversation saying how insecure you are. It's the same thing with somebody who's out that long a time and who wants to get into it no that wasn't a disadvantage that was a great advantage right well that you know that again going back to the lawyer the stereotypical lawyer personality it's sort of like the negative thinking it's not having a growth mindset just sort of thinking well um in terms of marketing okay i'm not i'm not good at marketing i've had many clients i just had one a new client last week say i'm not good at marketing well it you know that's because her perception of being good at marketing means going to these large functions and shaking a lot of hands and walking away with business cards and suddenly having, you know, clients to pitch business to. But then I talked to her more and it turns out that, you know, her family has a, a restaurant. She's very interested in the hospitality industry. She does a lot of work in it. She enjoys it. She likes food and she likes talking to people. So like her way of marketing is going to be different, but her fixed mindset was, and we're working on changing that, I am not good at marketing, but you're not, you don't like certain types of marketing, but there are ways that you can improve. Well, everything takes practice. We have another question that is going back to the market, market, market piece, marketing piece. 
how do you go about networking and approaching potential new clients? Well, I mean, it depends upon what context you're meeting them in, um, you know, approaching new clients. I mean, it, it, the, the main thing to focus on when you're meeting anybody in a business context is just building the relationship. It's all about relationship building. So Rudy, if you met somebody in the supermarket and they found out that you're the international counsel for the largest title insurance company in the world, and they started asking you, telling you that you'd be, they'd be happy to do work for you, that probably wouldn't be very effective, right? Probably not. <laughs> but if you met somebody in a social club that you belong to, and you found out that you had some common interests, and then it turns out that they like playing golf, and you like playing golf, which I know you don't, and I don't either, and then you went to play golf, then you get to know each other a little bit better that way or some other activity they're interested in, um, in certain nonprofit causes. So it's getting to know people and trying to find ways to be helpful. I mean, fundamentally, that's where it all starts. I also think, Steve, just to add to what you're saying, and I agree 100% with it, you have to understand the markets you want to work with. So, for example, I was an adoption lawyer for many years. The, the client's... Uh, hire attorneys in that area very differently than they would hire a criminal defense attorney, very differently than they would hire um, a personal injury lawyer. Adoptive families will get information from everybody, sit down, read it all, maybe call and ask questions and make eventually make their choice from there. Why? Because you're getting them, you're helping them with their child, which is the most important thing in their life as a couple that they're doing. So I used to say, I'll give you a half hour free consultation. And nobody called. I had my assistant go to Office Max at the time and get some folders and we put stuff in there. And I started sending packages out. Nothing fancy. I didn't hire a marketing person. But based on that, they started calling. People mm -hmm. started calling. I developed a thriving business. The other, in some fields of law, other lawyers are great sources of referrals. Uh, if you're, for example, a patent lawyer, you're obviously going to get referrals from a number of attorneys who aren't patent lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. So knowing your, the market you want to go in will sometimes dictate the best way to market it, I mean, to, to, to market yourself. That's just my, my spin on it because different markets have different needs. Absolutely. So my, uh, one of my you know, repeated jokes, I tell a lot of stupid dad jokes in the work that I do. And um, I, I need to have new clients because my family is sick of hearing them. So one of my repeated stupid dad jokes is that if you, you want to marry somebody Jewish, don't hang out at Catholic singles dances. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Any recommendations for foreign lawyers now residing in the U.S.? who are struggling to get a job at a law firm after starting LLM and passing the MA bar. Thanks. That is challenging. I, I think a lot of it is sort of what I was saying before about women getting back into the workforce or people who've been out of the workforce in general. You have to do it incrementally. I think it's, if you're open to getting sort of less than a full loaf, taking on projects, doing a lot of networking, finding someone that will give you a chance to do some work for them, and then grow that from there. If you're looking for a full-time permanent job with benefits, that's going to be harder. I, I, I would, my advice to this anonymous person would be target international companies because there may be a value in having somebody in-house who is a lawyer from that particular country or who thinks like a civil law lawyer, for example. And the number of law firms do hire foreign legal consultants because they have cross-border practices. So if you're a Mexican, say, licensed attorney and you've got your LLM, firms in California, companies in California, Texas, all along the border, you know, will help you. I remember years, years ago, I met a foreign legal consultant who worked for a, a large firm in, in Colorado. And... You know, you, what, do you, what, what does Colorado have to do with Argentina? No, it has to do with the business that goes back and forth, okay? So my, my advice to them would be 
look at who's doing cross-border work and develop relationships with them. So to add to what you're saying, uh, and I wasn't suggesting that the only way to get a, a job as an LLM is to do it on a fractional basis, it's diversifying your search a little bit. So that sounds like that, you know, what Rudy, what you're suggesting is one strategy. My suggestion is another strategy. And so you, you have to think a little bit more like a venture capitalist, like you're going to do 10 things and eight of them will produce no results and two of them might bear some good fruit. And I think the hard thing for lawyers and the lawyer mentality is that like to, to understand that it's okay that those eight things don't happen, that you have all these other opportunities that can turn into something that, that you want, whether it's business at your law firm or whether it's finding a job. And, and, and create a matrix too. create, create a, a, a written plan of what you're going to do and then set time frames in which to implement those things. I, I think is, is critical. Steve, you have, you gave me a list of lawyers are, and I'm fascinated by that list. I, I want to start with the last one is professional identity. Lawyers don't like to think of themselves as salespeople. I, I, I agree with you, but the reality of it is a lawyer has to be a salesperson. Mm -hmm. and 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 why and, and yet that's a negative thing that lawyers say to themselves i'm not a salesperson right and so i work a lot with my clients if i'm working with them on marketing to kind of reframe that notion it's like you're not out there selling you're you're building relationships and if people can see it you know lots of people actually enjoy relationship building they don't want to be the one who's selling a used car but they're happy to talk to someone help talk to an accountant and and find out how they can make referrals to them and be helpful to them that's well, I think, yeah i think you have to define what's a sales people most lawyers are in sales because you're constantly marketing your goods and you may not want to admit it but you are a sales person because you want that client to hire you or why would that person hire you or other people which means you have to sell yourself in, in our world, selling yourself is building the trust that you can do the work. That that's what you're selling. You know, you're not selling title insurance. You're not selling roofing. You're not selling. You're selling a service where it's based on trust, and that that's when you're the salesperson. You have to sell that every day. Let's go to the next one. Lawyers score up high on urgency, lack of patience. That's me. Okay, you might as well put Rudy Rivera. Lack of patience. <laughs> the other one is lawyers have a fixed mindset. Let's talk about that one a little bit. What do you mean by that? So the notion there is that we we come up with these, these ideas about who we are and then that we're never going to be anything different. And I think I've mentioned a few of them. One is, you know, I'm not a, I, you know, I'm not good at marketing. You know, I, I met a woman uh, a couple of weeks ago. She's getting some some criticism about her research and writing. And, you know, she's relatively early in her career, but she's almost ready to throw in the towel because she's getting some negative feedback. And I said, well, you know, do you feel like this is not something you can fix at all or have no interest in fixing at all? I said, well, like, if your writing got better, your research got, skills got better, would you be happy with that? So anyway, I ended up introducing her to a writing coach. So she's going to work on it. But her initial gut reaction is, I'm not good enough to be here. And frankly, I'm sure that the lawyers that she works with were pretty good at reinforcing that because lawyers can be pretty harsh critics. We have a question from our LinkedIn audience. How has relationship building changed since the pandemic and more people opting um, to do things virtually now well um let me start with the positive because i mean for me it's been a phenomenal opportunity because i'm part of this national business networking group called provisors that i mentioned early on and i am now getting a chance to meet people everywhere in the country so that organization has a very good system of getting people to come to meetings and then you have you're paired up with people to have follow-up meetings 
So the thing that's really changed is that if it's if it's virtual networking, you have to be very deliberate. You have to really go out of your way to try to connect with people. And if you're sitting at a meeting and there's like 30 people there and you only see these little Hollywood squares, you got to look at the people that are there. And if you don't even connect with them in breakout rooms or whatever while you're online, it's a good idea to try to target the people that sound interesting or people that you want to get to know for whatever reason, because you think maybe they're serving the same clientele, or maybe they're even a good potential client, but more likely they're just a good referral source and you could be a good referral source to them. And then set up times after that bigger event to meet with them one-on-one -on -one. and then setting next steps. So for me, I think I was telling you this, Rudy, before we got started today, that, you know, I have a podcast and I had you on my podcast. And for me, the most important or one of the most important and valuable things about having a podcast is it gives me another touch point. So I meet somebody and if they're really interesting, like you are, your story was really interesting to me. I said, how would you like to be a guest on my podcast? So yes, it did create some collateral, marketing collateral, you know, for me to share with, with people in my network, but it was a chance for me to get to know you better or writing an article with somebody is a way to get to know them better or just having next steps. That, that, that was a very good question. You and I would have never met more likely, but for this new virtual world we're living in. Absolutely. I've met Mexican lawyers in Switzerland I've interacted with. And interestingly, two of them are in the building right next to each other. They don't know each other. I from Jacksonville had to introduce him. By the way, do you know such and such who? And they say, yeah, he's in the building next to me. Uh, somebody who was uh, head of our marketing in one of the California divisions said to me once, Rudy, LinkedIn is like going to a dance. You can stand in the corner and just be a wallflower, or you can go out and mingle with people. So what you got to do is the virtual mingle. You can make a lot of great relationships. As a result of the pandemic, I have a great friend now in Australia, a great friend in India. I have you up in Maine. Those relationships can really be developed. And in Puerto Rico, I met a law professor I respect greatly, from this Zoom, when I took my trip to Puerto Rico, we had lunch. It was an incredible lunch. So don't think of this as a negative is all I can say. It's it's really not. I think in some ways it's easier. And of course, again, going back to the theme of our, our conversation today. So the lawyer brain would say, oh, you know, there's this pandemic. I, I can't, you know, I'm not going to go. I don't want to go into public places. How am I going to meet people? I guess I guess I can't meet people. So therefore, I'm not even going to try. Well, quickly, we can go some of the other things. It says having a fixed mindset, and that's pretty self-explanatory. They just stagnant there. I remember my one law partner, when I was going to do international adoption, said, oh, my God, you're going to get sued. Stick to what you know. And I would say the opposite. Go outside your comfort zone because you never know what's going to be successful. Well, the yeah, other, yeah, no, no, go ahead. No, I mean, the, I mean, the law firms that are really going to do well as the economy as you continues to evolve are the ones that are looking into the future, not what is, not what has our business been in the past and how can we keep replicating that, but what are the trends? You know, like, I don't know, I just, like a month ago, I think chat GPT, I don't know if you've been following that whole thing, but no. um, uh, artificial intelligence is now able to like write entire term papers just with a one sentence prompt into a computer. And it has like really, really wild implications for, you know, education and, and all sorts of things. Well, I just saw, I think it was a law firm announced that they're doing a, a seminar on the subject. So they're thinking ahead or, you know, the law firms that sort of got on the cannabis train rather than waiting for you know, every other law firm to do it. And now they're not the first ones there. So it's sort of looking forward and not just saying, well, I've got a good real estate practice. I'm just going to do that. Uh, or in your case, you saw an opportunity to do international adoption and you didn't just stand still and do what you had always been doing. You looked for new opportunities. I think you should always grow and look for new opportunities. You said something else too. Lawyers are low on resilience. Low on resilience. We do not like being um, criticized. And that has lots of implications. Um, 
in many different contexts, you know, lawyers and law firms get feedback from, from an attorney on their writing. Again, you sort of go to a dark place. Well, you know, I'm just not any good at this. Um, and here's where resilience comes up most in, in my mind, in terms of the work that I do, in terms of marketing. Again, it goes back to follow up. So you don't hear back from somebody and you feel like, oh, what did I do wrong? So uh, another story I had, uh, I, I've been developing a relationship with somebody in professional development in a major law firm. And there are some opportunities for me to do some work with that firm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've, I've had a couple of nice conversations. I even actually interviewed this individual. Um, and then I reached out to him, like, I think it was October, November, didn't hear back from him, uh, December. And then I reached out to him again in January. And, but I was feeling a little bit rejected, you know, that he hadn't responded. He hadn't followed up and I had to really push myself, but I did. And then it turns out his father had died in December. So then I was really feeling like a jerk for not understanding that it wasn't just about me. But a lot of lawyers that I work with when they're doing their follow-up, when they've got a list of 10 prospects or referral sources that they're trying to cultivate relationships with, if they don't hear back from somebody or they send a proposal and the, the, the potential client doesn't respond, they just give up. I'm I'm looking. Uh, I have my head down because I'm I'm looking at three devices. You know, I'm looking at my iPad, field the questions from LinkedIn, and and I'm looking at uh, my laptop and monitoring, and I'm restreamed. So I feel like a a Zoom DJ. At you, are. you are. You are. You are Zoom DJ. You're very hip. Um, I guess I'm a millennial. Um, <laughs> Uh, one that uh, we know, lawyers value their autonomy. I think we understand that. The one I like to focus a little bit on is lawyers are not always the best listeners. What did you say? Lawyers are not. No, always just that was a joke. That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> I know, but I was taking into account your age. Okay, that you probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not 69 yet. I'm. 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 I'm getting. In, I'm moving in that direction. But. Um. That's absolutely true. Lawyers are not the best listeners. Like we're we're taught in law school to speak up, to be eloquent, to give good answers. The Socratic method, you know, how do you come across? Uh, if you're a, a trial lawyer, you're 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 expected to make an eloquent presentation. But if you're managing people, I mean, I I would argue that being a good listener is actually a really important skill for practicing law, also. But it's particularly important in marketing, it's particularly important in leadership, because if you're jumping in and, and telling and trying to solve people's problems before you even know what they are, you are not going to deliver what they want to hear. It's actually true when you're practicing law too, but. It, I think it's universal, no matter what your profession is, as you say, you have to listen. I, I tell my students, I don't know if you can see it through the Zoom thing. I, I ask my students every year, can you tell me what color this cases inevitably they all say red 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 so no that's not my question my question is can you tell me what color the case is yes what color is the case you'd be surprised very few people say red initially uh, and, and that's just an example to bring the point home we think we listen but we don't always There's it's also well, mm -hmm. uh, go ahead no go ahead well i mean it's also how are we listening so are we listening just so that we could respond with our own experience like mm -hmm. I once once worked with somebody who no matter what bad thing that happened in my life or anybody else's life, it's like, oh, well, I had, you know, I had a friend die also. It's like, you know. They have to one up you. They have to one up you. <laughs> or or they're not really listening. They're just listening so that they can respond about something going on with them. And then active listening is more, you know, you say something and I, and I ask you to kind of articulate it. And then really deep listening mm -hmm. is like, boy, boy, you know, Rudy, you really seem like you really enjoyed this 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 gig have you thought about becoming a talk show host you know it's like really trying to tune into what might really be going on for somebody that's the deepest level of listening that i think a lot of us don't get to as often as we could and and if you really want your team if you're a leader if you really want your team to perform at the highest levels you want to really show that you've got their back and that's the way you show it that's the way you demonstrate by, by, by listening 
There's a great song by Mike and the Mechanic in the, the Living Years. You can only listen as well as you hear. Mm. It's a great song. Uh, another one is the analytical thinking. We know that's that's you know that's obvious, right? And analytical thinking goes along with you know the thinking part of it. Um, we well, do can like I can I can I say something more about that? Yeah, so I, so I had a client today. I had introduced him to another lawyer in another part of the country to because he's has some issues around forming a partnership. And this other lawyer had some experience with partnership agreements. And so I introduced him and he thought it was going to be sort of this friendly, you know, we're all part of the same network. So he thought it was going to be this sort of friendly get to know you kind of. And she didn't really have any pleasantries with him. She just started. She was basically sort of setting him up to send him a fee agreement without really finding out anything about him, without getting to know him. Um, I mean, ultimately he needs her help figuring out what's the best way to structure his partnership. But it would have been nice if she had spent a little time finding out where he lives and what he, you know, just something personal about him. That, that happened to me in a similar situation in Mexico, also in the US, but in Mexico, I am talking to a lawyer for the first time about a matter referred by another person. He said, well, I didn't really read the whole thing. I just kind of breezed through it. And that was it. And I won a $25,000 retainer. I said, thank you. We're done. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not shy about saying we're done. Thank you. See you later. Okay. Um, you, you know, getting, I want to just get back uh, with a little time we have about the getting smart. I, I always tell people I need to be the dumbest one in the room. I need you to educate me. And if I'm smarter than you and you're the people I'm paying, there's an issue here. Okay. Now, yes, I have a lot of experience. I can contribute. But I just tell them up front, I expect you to tell me I'm here to listen. And, you know, a mistake I think that inside counsel make is they think they know more than the outside lawyer who practices in that every day. And Inside counsel also needs to listen. So the listening doesn't just apply to outside counsel; it applies to inside counsel. You know, the the other features, uh, Steve, are lawyers like precedent. Lawyers prefer structural or flexibility. Lawyers are risk adverse, and lawyers are skeptical. The skeptical part goes to your example. Oh my God, he doesn't want to hire me. What did I do wrong? Charge too much. Charge too little. Just the age old self doubt. And it's we also, all, we've all done it. Go ahead. Yeah. And it's also, you know, skepticism, Larry Richard, I heard him talk about the skepticism is a reciprocal quality. So uh, a, a reciprocal trait. So if you're skeptical with me, I'm going to be skeptical with you. Whereas, you know, in relationship building, you're trying to build trusted relationships so that somebody will want to refer work to you or so that somebody will want to buy into your vision of where the law firm should be going. So if, if a law firm partner meeting, you know, one of the partners, you know, throws out an idea and then you are the magic partner and you start attacking it, like how often do you think people are going to want to offer, offer their ideas? Your, you know, your skepticism is going to interfere with people's willingness or interest in participating. But as a leader, you want to be, you know, show and demonstrate and build trust so that people will come to you with problems and that you can problem solve them. You know, a funny story about people not listening. I was managing an office in Puerto Rico and I brought the sales staff. I brought not the sales. I brought everybody in as we were trying to keep the business afloat. There were some changes in the marketplace. I said to everybody, now listen to me carefully. If any of you bring some important relationships to the table, although you're not commissioned at bonus time, we'll take that into consideration. And you, you have your regular jobs with family members you know, associates you might know, and we provide this service and they come through you, then there will be some reward, some remuneration. When they left, they panicked. Oh, my God, he wants us to go out of the streets and sell. <laughs> I had to call them back in and said, no, that's not what I said. Um, so that's that pretty funny. That's just a funny example of people not listening, you know. But were, we they, were, to, they, were, they, were they lawyers? No, they weren't lawyers. Oh, okay. I wasn't telling them to practice law. It was, you know, we sold insurance and saying, hey, you've got relationships. You know, if you bring them this way, 
you know, I, we couldn't pay commissions because they weren't agents, but we could, you know, I can definitely pay bonuses, you know, on work performance and things like that. But it's, you know, they all panicked and they just were, were so afraid, you know, because they were afraid to do anything new. But, and I think lawyers are like that too. Lawyers are reluctant to do, try something new. They've, they, um, they're used to doing what they do. But I, now I think this generation is more adaptable to doing different things and in different ways. And that that's just the way of the world. Steve, the world is changing around us faster than we can blink an eye. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. We're going to end this now for our um, for our, our, our uh, LinkedIn audience. Well, before and, you do that, before you do that, can I uh, yeah. just offer my contact information? Yes, we're going to do that online, but you can offer it now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. If anybody has any further questions, I'm always happy to talk to people, make an appointment with me. I'm happy to do a free consultation, seckler.com, S-E-C-K-L-E-R. And I've got lots of other resources there, links to my podcast, and you can make an appointment or join one of my free mastermind roundtables and talk about these issues with other lawyers. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording. Don't forget, you are watching Conversations with Rudy Rivera.